Hey everybody, big shout out to one of my Rado Runs Through backers, Ed Gas Donnelly, who wanted to see this run through. Ed, I hope you enjoyed it. And now, hey everybody, final thoughts time for Unicorns Knights, which is a very clever, very unique game. I'm hard pressed to think of another co op out there that's quite like it. Um, you know, this whole notion of us working co together collaboratively to try to keep this princess alive. But she's got a mind of her own. Um, you think you know what she's going to do. You can plot out right at the end of this round, she's going to move here, then here, then here. She'll die if she does that. What are we going to do to stop that? Can we, um, you know, uh, you know, clear a path for her so she doesn't run into trouble? Can we support her by getting more troops so that she'll survive the fight that she's about to run into? Or can we redirect her and make her go in a different direction entirely, which will create a whole bunch of other problems, potentially? That is a very, very cool loop that you keep going through round after round after round. And then, when you add to that the really brilliant setup system, where every time you play, you take these tiles, you play them out randomly, and then that creates this very interesting minefield that she has to navigate. because. All the, the special villains have unique abilities. The ones that chase after you, or even worse, chase after her can really be a problem. Um, so, But then that adds more stuff. Oh, she's heading right for the dragon. We're not tough enough to beat the dragon. The dragon will completely decimate her forces. What can we do? I know. I will sacrifice myself. I'll run up in there and drag the dragon away and take him off over to the far side where I will get cornered and probably killed. But that's okay because it means the princess gets through. Being able to make those kinds of decisions and those kinds of gambits and having them pay off is a really, really cool feeling. And while I didn't get into it in the uh, gameplay, the notion of self-sacrifice, you, know, um, you know, doing whatever it takes to make sure the princess survives is a really common thing. You'll find you probably do that a fair bit because if your character dies, um, that just means you end up taking one of the remaining characters and um, out and start over. And you'll actually, sometimes you'll want to actually die specifically because, oh my gosh, all the action is happening over there on the other side of the world. Uh, it would take me forever to get over there. You know what? I'm just going to fight these guys specifically so that I'll die because then I can create a new character and spawn over in that area and help out. Interesting stuff like that happens as well. Um, like I said, there's just a lot of really interesting scenarios and really interesting problems to solve. I mean, like any cooperative game, this is at its heart a puzzle game where the game you know, conspires to throw a lot of interesting disparate elements and you've got to figure out how to navigate through them. The fact that this isn't about us. Us surviving, winning or losing doesn't matter at all. It's all about her and um, you know, trying to support her makes this really feel unique. I really like it a lot in theory. In practice, though, I've got a couple of issues with it. One, and now this is a personal peccadillo, a lot of people aren't going to be bothered by it, but if you want to play this as a two-player game, um, each player has to control two characters. So there is no two-player game. Basically, it's a four-player game masquerading as a two-player. I don't like that at all. I, it's maybe, I, I, I always find it just kind of like a cheap shortcut when it boils right down to it. Suddenly, I can't really feel like I'm connected to my characters. Instead, I'm just some armchair general ordering people around what to do, and you just get kind of left at arm's length. You don't get like sucked into the experience as much when I'm not controlling a character. That's me. I will make a... No, I'm not going to make a brave sacrifice. I'll just order that guy that I'm controlling to make a brave sacrifice. That's always a shame, and I wish they would have done a little bit more work. You can play as a three-player game, and they just increase the number of actions everybody gets. I would have liked to see something like that happen in a two-player to make it a little bit more amenable. So that's unfortunate. Another thing that I'm less than crazy about is, as cool as this is, for my taste, it probably runs a little bit longer than it should. I mean, this is a two-plus-hour game, Jen and I have found. I mean, maybe when you get up to speed, you can get it down to 90 minutes, but still, we generally tend to prefer cooperative games that, you know, like kind of tap out in an hour. Because if you put in two or two and a half hours and then you lose, oh my gosh, that's so crushing. If I lose after 45 minutes, no big deal. Hey, let's set up and try again. But um, the amount of time, uh, you know, the the... The, the, the commitment you have to make to play this all the way through from start to finish, uh, you know, maybe for folks who like really long epic co-ops, it'll work out. But Jen and I, we prefer our co-ops uh, to be shorter and quicker, more pandemic length. And so for us, that's a problem. But I mean, for others, it might not be an issue. I really kind of wish they would have like kind of an express mode 
in the rules that basically uh, would, I don't know, probably cut out about 30% of the land. So there's just less space to travel and um, you know, put the, the princess in more danger right from the get-go, give us more power right from the get-go, just to, just to get you past those early stages when not much is happening. She's just starting out. We're just starting out. We don't have a lot of special powers. It's towards the middle and the end of the game that really interesting stuff starts to happen. I just want to get to that faster and have a quicker game. Um, oh, one thing I should warn about. The rule book that comes in this box from the AEG, um, this is the second edition from AEG. The rule book, man, it has really big problems. It's uh, very, very tough to learn the game, and I would highly recommend, if you do pick this up, go on to AEG sites or on BoardGameGeek and download the second version of the rules they put out. They completely rewrote them, and the new ones that you can download are make it much, much easier to jump in. Uh, because, like I said, this is such an unusual game. It has a completely different rhythm than what you might be expecting from other games of its ilk. Uh, the rules, you need to make them as good as possible. Um, there's, uh, yeah. I think those are the main issues. One thing we did find is, you know, it can be kind of frustrating if you find yourself off out in the middle of nowhere and you really can't be part of the action. Jen and I have found when we do that, that, um, you know, it's so costly to move from one side of the world to the other that, um, well, heck, maybe I will just go on ahead and throw myself on my sword solely so that I can teleport somewhere else with a new character. Although there's a downside to that, too. Every time one of the heroes dies, that means the, uh, the, the event track moves faster forward so you have less time to make it. Um, I, I, I do kind of miss one of the cool things that makes Pandemic stand out from all the Pandemic clones that are out there is the fact that there are fast ways to get around. And there's not really anything like that. You do have to work hard to get from point A to point B. And now why I like that? Because this is a game of logistics. If I have a big army following me, of course it's going to be very expensive and very spendy in terms of resources to get them from one side of the world to the other. And by the same token, it's much quicker and easier if you um, have everybody die. I mean, there's, there's ways to get around it, but I do kind of wish... I mean, I guess it just kind of fits with the whole... I, I wish the world was just a little bit smaller, the game was a little bit shorter, um, so that there's just, you know, there, there's always more velocity, more going on. As it is right now, it's a big old world, and it takes a long time to get from one place to the other. I guess i just like to see the whole thing compacted a little bit more, um, because again, Jen and I are looking for a faster cooperative experience than what this gives. But, um, you know, all that aside, if, you look at, if you're looking for something really outside the box, I mean, I'm trying to think of what else is like this, and probably... What it reminds me of more than anything else is actually dungeon pets, which is kind of a weird thing, but it's because the whole thing centers around this creature, this character, not creature, I was thinking dungeon pets, who is completely out of our control. We can anticipate what we think she's going to do. And you know what? Most of the time, our anticipation will pay off. She'll go and she'll do what we expect. But there are confounding factors. Like, I mean, you only got to see a little bit of it, but those fate cards are so brilliant. They're such a really awesome narrative device that, oh, whenever the princess or I steps into an area and we I become bound by fate to this bad guy, what does it mean? Like probably the coolest one is the game is the one that, you know, if I, if I went way off somewhere and I became bound to a fate to a character who was way off in the West, the fate could be, I forget what it's called, but basically he becomes interesting to the princess and suddenly the princess completely forgets about getting to the castle and changes her direction and goes towards that villain because she feels like it's her destiny to defeat that villain. And like, whoa, and when that happens, everything changes. And there's lots of cool little things like that where the game can surprise you, either because she speeds up or slows down. It's sharp. It's fun. Um, I, I, I have a few little complaints about it that are, for Jens and my taste, make it not really a keeper. But if we were up for longer cooperative games, and if we had four players available or three players instead of just two, I, I, I think this would be a keeper for us because it's really, really sharp. There's a lot to like here in Unicronus Nights. And that's it, folks. Thanks for watching. Have a very, very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Uh, bye bye.